and I'm uh, very happy to be here today to give this talk uh, on a program that I had been working on recently and forth, primarily for my own understanding of some quantum effects that are related to this experiment. And I'll have to alternate my talk a little bit between um, the fourth program and describing some of the basic underlying physics, uh, all at a very uh, conceptual level. And, uh, oh, you know, one has to work reasonably hard to avoid saying inaccurate things. But we are going back to the basics. And uh, as, of course, all of us who program and forth know from uh, the book starting forth, uh, spin is right there from the very start. And I'll be talking about the physical property of so the spin of particles and how to simulate um, experiments that have to do with sort of the fundamental uh, nature of the theory and what it implies about uh, reality. So nothing practical here. Uh, washing machine is, of course, very practical. And here's the general outline of, of the talk. Um, so the program that I am uh, going to talk about is called EPR-SIM, and there will be a link to it in this presentation. I think the presentation slides are available at, uh, at some link. Uh, and if, uh, if that link can be made available in, in some fashion, uh, I think uh, that would be helpful maybe to some of the participants here. Just to reassure um, you, it will be on the Euroforce website. It will be available. Very good. Um, so let me uh, go ahead and uh, I'm going to talk about quantum theory in a couple of slides, and that's a vast subject. Uh, one of the difficulties with the presentation like this is that uh, I'm prone to uh, going off on tangents, and so I'll need the I'll need the moderator to get me back on track if I deviate too far from advancing the slides. So please do that. And if any of you uh, have a question in the middle, please raise your hand and uh, ask for the moderator to let me know verbally that there's a question. So I'll start with this uh, quote by Goethe uh, back in the early 1800s in which he is uh, making a case for bringing a physicist to Frankfurt, to the city of Frankfurt, and uh, to work with chemists and, and elucidate more of the nature of uh, phenomena that are not uh, covered at that time in the, in the standard chemistry. And uh, he's uh, arguing that uh, that's a better use of time than a lot of other things. So whether that's actually the case, whether that's a romanticized notion of physicists and chemists, uh, you know, on the average, I think it may be true. Uh, so his comment led directly to the creation of uh, a physical society in, in Frankfurt, which later um, played a role in bringing about the University of Frankfurt, which is shown in the picture here. And more information are at these links. So we're going to talk about an experiment conducted at the University of Frankfurt in 1922. And next year will be the 100th anniversary of that experiment. So we had, we saw the washing machine. There are other kinds of spin machines that deal with the spins of particles. The stern gerlach experiment was that experiment in Frankfurt uh, in 1922. And a nice historical overview of it from a physics perspective is given in the link on this page. Uh, basically, the experiment consisted of emitting uh, a beam of silver atoms. It's basically an oven at some high temperature, like maybe 1100 degrees C. And uh, the picture shows silver atoms streaming out of a slit in the oven. Of course, all this area here is a vacuum and this was an exper a, a very difficult experiment to do at that time because of the vacuum that was required and, and various other uh, issues, technical issues. Uh, 
the silver atoms pass in between the poles of a magnet, an asymmetric uh, magnet, so that there's a inhomogeneous magnetic field that varies along the vertical direction and varies in strength. And um, so the B field here points downward. And uh, what they were expecting to see is that uh, if the silver atoms possessed any spin due to uh, motion of charges, then uh, that would act like a bar magnet. The atom, it's each atom would have a, a essentially a magnetic field that's similar to what a bar magnet would generate. And they would get a dispersion of all of those magnets. Uh, the inhomogeneous magnetic field causes a vertical deflection here. And uh, they were expecting to see a continuous stream, although there were some predictions at that time, which was in between the old Bohr quantum theory which explained the uh, energy levels of the hydrogen atom as seen spectroscopically, and the new quantum theory of Schrodinger, which was developed later in 1926. But there were some predictions that it might separate into uh, several beams. And in fact, what they saw was that uh, it's, it's split up into exactly two beams. And this is exaggerated, but uh, there's some photographic plate out here on which the silver atoms landed and uh, they were able to see that separation. And what that meant was that the uh, bar magnets were aligned in exactly one of two positions with respect to the field. And if you think of a, a classical bar magnet, then you would expect that if the spin, if that magnet was oriented in all possible direction, then you shouldn't just have two uh, specific orientations with the component along the B field being quantized into a, uh, a plus and a minus orientation, into just two discrete orientations. And so that was the phenomenon that was seen. And uh, Einstein was very interested in this experiment. And people were looking for explanations within the classical electrodynamics of that time, essentially Maxwell's equations, and they could find none. But the quantization of angular momentum, which was proposed by some physicists at that time, would give an explanation for this. And, in, and of course, today we know that that was actually due to the spin of the valence electron, single valence electron of the uh, silver atom and all of the other electrons, which also have uh, spins and correspondingly uh, an associated uh, dipole moment or a magnetic moment, um, were all paired and canceled each other out. And so this was the result of that experiment. Today, uh, we have a very practical application of that, which is the MRI scanner. And uh, I had to plead with my daughter to make this next drawing that she did for me somewhat in an MRI, MRI scanner, but basically the protons in the hydrogen atoms in your body are similar to the electron in the silver atom. And uh, the magnetic field causes uh, the energy levels between these two different orientations of the protons to separate to the point where an RF coil can excite from one state to the other state of the proton spins. And then when they relax back, they emit a signal. And one can form an image using uh, various techniques by that method. And this cannot be understood with the classical electrical engineering that's taught in universities even today. It, it involves quantum theory. And uh, let me give a, a brief example of some of the uh, visual output of the program. So if we have one of those silver atoms that came through the stern gerlach apparatus, let's say it went into the up branch. So it's a particle that uh, is what we call spin up quantum state. And it's with respect to the Z axis and it's coming along over the Y axis here. If we take a second stern gerlach magnet and rotated by an angle theta with respect to the z axis in the z x plane, then the uh, question is what will it do at that point? 
Now we know that if we put the second magnet along the z-axis, there will be a definite uh, deflection upward. In other words, we prepared a spin up state with the first magnet and uh, the second magnet will give us the same result. But if we rotate the axis, then um, the quantum theory that was developed uh, allows us to predict the possibility or the probabilities that um, the atom will deflect up or down with respect to this new axis. So if you look at these green and red trajectories, you can they, they will be in a plane that's defined by the new theta and y axes here. So if we have zero degrees, um, and this is sort of the setup code for this particular experiment, and uh, it will make a little bit more sense as we go along. But we see that basically on this detector that we place, we're getting all ups when it's at zero degrees. And at 60 degrees, there's sort of a, a few instances where it's also down in a sort of random fashion. And then at 120 degrees, see it's mostly down with a few instances of up. And actually at 90 degrees, it would be a 50-50 mixture. Here are the probabilities uh, for up at the three different angles. And, and so you can see uh, that it varies. And there, there is a mathematical formula is, that you can write down, but that's not important. What's really important is the measurement statistics that you see here, because you can infer by doing the experiment what the, uh, what the formula is by making manual counts and determining the probabilities. So let's look at the program here, EPR-SIM. So we basically have the visual elements of the user interface, and, and we can do this with it. We can do a lot of these measurements with the user interface, or we can automate the ex an experiment by coming out of this interface and writing a script uh, to do an experiment. And we'll see an example of that. Um, we basically have an emitter, which emits two particles, two spin it. Uh, two spins, one going this direction, another one going in the other direction. And these detectors are basically uh, the stern gerlach analyzers along with a detection scheme to see which, which path the particle took. And if it went up, the green uh, circle will light up. And if it went down, the uh, red will light up. And what we're going to do is set the quantum state for the two particles. And that state is described by these four numbers here, which are complex numbers. And then each detector can be put at three different angles given by the little selector indicator. And uh, those angles can be mapped to whatever, uh, whatever angles you want to select. And then we can run the experiment. And what we can do is, uh, you see the key commands here. So L selects the left detector, R the right detector, one, two, three, sets the axis for that particular detector that's selected. Um, e runs a single event where it emits a single pair of particles. And there's a little animation that, just for uh, illustrative purposes. And then it will uh, record everything on these tape recorders here. So there's an event number the selector setting on the detector, and then which way did the particle go? And what we're interested in are these joint probabilities from the, for the same events. What's the probability that we'll get an up-up event, probability for an up-down, and a down-up, and a down-down event. Uh, also, going back to these commands, so E does a single event, and C puts it in continuous mode, where it's the emitters constantly emitting pairs of particles. And you'll see this tape scrolling up with the new measurements. You can halt it uh, from the con continuous measurement mode. You can do a fixed number of trials uh, with T. So you can tell it 10,000 trials is what I want to do. And it'll do it very quickly. Uh, and then there's an X for clearing out all of the measurement counts and the probabilities. And then there's 
cue for quit to return back to the fourth prompt so that you can do some uh, different setup if you want. I don't have edit fields yet for some of these uh, so that you can edit them from the user interface. But the code is about roughly between 800 to 900 lines long. It makes use of some libraries. And uh, it's uh, most of that code is the user interface. A small portion of it is the physics part of this. But the reason I set it up like this, one can you know, just give you the results of mathematical formulas, but this gives you a visual picture of what an experiment consists of. And the experiments we're going to talk about have been done, in fact, uh, although only since the 1980s have we gotten conclusive results that validated the claims. Uh, but quantum theory was right anyway, and uh, Einstein knew it. He just thought that there was a deeper reality behind quantum theory. So in a few short slides, let me describe quantum theory. And uh, what we uh, have as a basis for the description for, uh, of quantum theory is the quantum state. And what it does is it predicts the possibility, probabilities of possible measurement outcomes. And uh, in our case of a single particle with spin going through a certain girl like magnet, we have uh, probabilities of going up and probability of going down. And the two, of course, have to add up to one. Uh, quantum theory does not predict, in general, the results of individual measurements. Uh, if the probabilities are not, either of these are not one, then it means you'll get a random sampling for your individual measurement. And this is, of course, very different from classical physics, in which uh, you can know precisely what, uh, what the answer is, in principle, by by using the theory to evolve the system in time. So uh, you know, these, uh, these are sort of uh, the consequences of some of the axioms here that every possible measurement outcome of an observable, an observable can be a physical property that we're, we know about from classical physics like energy or angular momentum or linear momentum. Every possible measurement outcome has a probability amplitude, and, and I'll stress this is not a probability, uh, although it's related to a probability. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. And upon measurement, one of the possible outcomes is obtained. So in the case of the spin, we get uh, an angular momentum value, which is in, in units of h bar over 2. It's either plus or minus h bar over 2 for the electron spin. And the probability amplitudes follow a dynamics law. So the Schrodinger equation provides the uh, deterministic rule for how the probabilities, well, how the probability amplitudes evolve in time under a given uh, application of forces to a system. Um, so, you know, quantum theory is often talked about as a probability theory, but it's really a theory on the probability amplitudes. And the distinction is quite important because it, it, provide, it allows for phenomena which would, are really counterintuitive, and we'll see uh, uh, an example of that today. And some observables, some physical properties, cannot be measured with precise values simultaneously. For example, the position x and the corresponding momentum along x, those are a pair of observables that cannot have simultaneous values. So the description of the system cannot be simultaneously uh, in terms of both of those. And <coughs> another pair of observables are the spin components along the x and z directions. They cannot have simultaneous values. And the, and the uh, fundamental physical justification is that at the quantum level, measuring one disturbs the other so that if you want a precise measurement of x, you'll have to inevitably uh, alter the momentum of the, of the particle uh, in the x direction. And similarly, if you measure the spin in one direction, you'll, you'll modify the spin in the other direction. 
So uh, quantum states for computer scientists, and, and this is not meant to be any type of uh, dumbing down. In fact, it's a very precise specification. And the quantum state is a list of associations between our measurement outcomes that are possible. <clears throat> and these are typically real numbers like h bar over two or minus h bar over two and the probability amplitudes. And uh, so the measure, the possible measurement outcomes might be discrete, like in the case of spin of a particle or, <coughs> excuse me, uh, or they may be continuous, like the position coordinate of a, uh, of a particle, in which case this would be an infinite uh, list in a computer, when represented in a computer, but uh, generally most problems can, can be truncated and discretized, even for continuous variables. So I'm just using this Lisp-like notation for convenience. So we have measurement outcome one, which could be up or plus h bar over two. And the probability amplitudes are complex numbers, C1, C2, and so on in general. So a single spin one half particle state observed along a, a specified axis, and we'll say the z-axis for, <coughs> for argument's sake here, but it could be any axis. Uh, we'll have an up and a down measurement and two complex numbers associated with a single particle. And the magnitude squared of each one represents the probabilities uh, for those observations along that specified axis. Now, two spin one half particles are represented uh, by a state which looks at all the combined measurements. So you could have up for the first one and up for the second one, and that will have a particular uh, probability amplitude and then it's here are all the combinations of different outcomes that you can have. And of course, because we have to relate these to probabilities, the uh, requirement is that the, the magnitude squared of all of these complex numbers have to add to one. Now there's a combinatoric explosion here compared to being able to describe a quantum state of many particles compared to the individual particle states. And uh, we ask, can we factor two particle states as a product of separate one particle states? It's not immediately obvious here. So in Wisp, we might ask, are, are these equal? Uh, this list, which specifies a two particle state and then some product function, which we haven't defined or the the, the representation of the single particle states. And I'm using A and B to refer to the two different particles. And uh, Z1 is the probability amplitude for finding particle A and the up uh, measurement outcome and so on. <clears throat> and it turns out for consistency with the probability interpretation, this, this product must be defined in this particular way. And that leads to these relations between the C's and the Z's. Now, it's not obvious that there's a combinatoric explosion of information in the N particle representation because we see four complex amplitudes here and uh, four down here in the single particle case. But uh, the, uh, the reason it's, it does blow up is that we have these additional requirements that the magnitude of Z1 squared plus the magnitude of Z2 squared has to equal one. And so they're really only the equivalent of two complex numbers here, where there's the equivalent of three complex numbers here in the two particle state representation. And, uh, and these relations imply that these two particles are completely independent and that, uh, that uh, the measurement outcome of one does not imply the measurement outcome of the second particle. So 
these kinds of factored states or factorable states means that the this there's this independence of the two measurements. And in a case of an unfactorable two particle quantum state, which is allowed by quantum mechanics in its state description, uh, we can have these states which are called entangled, which means the same thing as unfactorable. And an example is this so called singlet two particle spin state. And the singlet terminology comes from spectroscopy. But uh, these are the four coefficients, and we can take them all to be real in this case, but uh, we have uh, C1 is zero, so the probability of uh, observing them uh, in the up, up configuration along the z-axis is zero, as well as the probability of observing both of them in the down-down configuration along the z-axis. And then the probability of observing them in the up-down and down-up configurations is one-half. Now, you can see that <clears throat> there's no way to satisfy no assignment of Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4 that will satisfy these equations. And you can convince yourself of that uh, by looking at it carefully. And our LISP expression evaluates to nil for entangled states. So there's no significant algebra that's necessary here to see that. <coughs> Excuse me. So we can use uh, the EPR SIM program to look at these uh, consequences of a state like the singlet state, which is shown here uh, on the right as uh, one over square root of two and minus one over square root of two, and the others are zero. And so we run uh, 10,000 trials with our two axes set to one and one, and we get, uh, you know, these are the Monte Carlo trials, so they're not going to give you exactly the same thing as the theory. Uh, you'll see the up, down, and down, up probabilities are a half. The bar graph needs a little work because of the discrete nature of the text graphics, but I think I can do much better than that using some Unicode characters, so I just haven't had a chance to work on that yet. So our left angle is zero, and our right angle is zero, and 10,000 trials were done, and it's showing the uh, the corresponding results and and you see for every up on this side you get a down and every down you get an up on the right side um, and similarly now if we change the axes to 60 degrees and 60 degrees oh we get the same thing <clears throat> and uh, finally if we set the axes to three and three as shown here by the detectors which is 120 degrees and 120 degrees. In fact, we get the same result. In fact, if we, anytime we set the axes to the same angle on both sides, we're gonna get a perfectly anti-correlated state. That is, uh, up on the left will tell you that you, you're gonna get a right, uh, I mean, you're gonna get a down on the right detector and vice versa, down on the left detector implies an up on the right detector. Furthermore, <clears throat> with respect to uh, just the part, the probability of a spin up or down on each particle, you can compute that because the particle of up or the left particle is just the sum of the P U U plus uh, P P U D. So you have to take into account both possibilities for the right particle. And when you add that, those two, that's a half. And for the particle on the right, you would add the UD and the DD. Uh, let's see, did I, no, wait a minute. I think I did that wrong. You know, the probability of up on the right particle would be uh, yeah, PUU plus PDU. So that's also a half. So, uh, What's bothering physicists about these statistics? Well, <clears throat> Einstein made this argument that if quantum mechanics is right, and he felt that its predictions were certainly right, that its description of the quantum state is incomplete. And 
the argument basically in this paper from 1935 <clears throat> goes, uh, the left and right detectors can be arbitrarily far apart and at different distances from the source. After measurements made on the left, the re result of the measurement on the right along the same axis may be predicted with certainty. And he argued because measurements have to be local, <clears throat> what, what the instrument measures on the left can't in any way disturb the measurement made on the right because they can be arbitrarily far apart. So if we chose a, a axis setting on the left detector of zero degrees, we know instantly that the particle on the right must, what it must do uh, based on the outcome of the measurement on the left. Similarly, we could choose the axis to be 90 degrees. And these are spins in different directions and those are mutually incompatible to have simultaneous values. And, and so he says, well, obviously we can know just by our choice of axis on the, on the left side, both components, uh, either component, the X component or the Z component, while not disturbing that particle in any way. Uh, and therefore the results of the spin measurements on the right have to exist independently of the measurement on the left. And, and therefore the quantum state description is incomplete. <clears throat> Now, he made this argument with a different example, which required a, a bit more mathematics, and Bohm and Aronov, uh, in a later paper in 1957, reduced it to these entangled spins. So let's look at the hidden variable explanations, as they're called. We assume there's a complete state description with parameters we don't know. And as an example, we take lambda to be a random bit, zero or one, that's generated at the source. So, you know, correlations are not causation as, as, as well drummed into our heads from statistics, but this is a different kind of correlation. <clears throat> so if we have this random bit generated at the source and it gets carried along with the particle to the detector where uh, the, the parameter, it becomes part of the physics that needs to be considered. Let's do this. We'll take the lambda and convert it to a complex number and assign it to lambda one. Here we'll take lambda and test to see if it's zero. <clears throat> and I do this instead of a flipping the bit because I want a minus one uh, for lambda two. Now we take this previously unfactorable state and with the addition of the lambda information, we get a down up with a minus one probability amplitude or an up down with a one probability amplitude. And these are factorable. I, I, I didn't write down all of the other components which are have zero probability amplitude for the two particle states here. But now Krishna, we get factorable states. Sorry, state. uh, yes. Krishna, just a second. You only got about 10 more minutes left just to give you okay. back on track. So it's very interesting. Please keep going on. But remember 10 okay. minutes about. Thank you. Uh, so uh, here we've got uh, factorable states where now some theory can say that on the left side, oh, we'll get an, a down when we're at zero degrees and, and lambda zero because it knows what lambda is there. Uh, or uh, or zero, we'll get a, uh, up when lambda is one and zero degrees. And if we look at all the possible combinations or assignments, <clears throat> we'll see that we have this, uh, and this will perfectly line up with our one, one, two, two, three, three axis, and that we'll get zero for up, up, and zero, zero probability for down, down, but one half for the other cases. However, if you look at the quantum mechanical statistics using the program for the case where the axes are set differently on both sides, the one, two axis, we see that we get, uh, these are actually theoretically one eighth and three eighths, one eighth here. However, that assignment that we made on the previous slide shows that we should get one fourth for all of those cases. So by making an assignment like this, where each particle has a, a predictable outcome due to this hidden variable lambda, we cannot 
get the same statistics that's predicted by quantum theory. And uh, we can define the correlation coefficient, uh, which is really the product of the two spins averaged when we take u is plus one and d equals minus one. And it's also equivalent, if you think about it, to this particular uh, combination of the up, 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 down, and down, up, and down, down probabilities. It's really the reflective correlation coefficient. Um, and <clears throat> E depends on the two detector angles, theta L and theta R. Now, what Bell, John Bell proved in uh, 1964 is that any kind of hidden variable theory involving any number of random variables and any possible assignments with different probability distributions for the random variables must give these correlations that satisfy this particular relation. And uh, so the one, two refers to the settings of the left detector and the right detector. And so you have to make three of these measurements at, or these measurements three times for different settings. And if you take this particular combination of correlations, it, it has to be less than or equal to one, and this is called a Bell inequality. <clears throat> and we can compute Bell's inequality with EPR sim. We can do it through the user interface, or we can write come out of the user interface and just simply write a script that will do all of those things using the functions provided by the program. And we'll find for this particular quantum state, the singlet state, that those three quantities, if we plug them into here, we get one and a half, which is of course not less than or equal to one. And what that means is there is no possible way to assign, no matter how many hidden variables you use, uh, if you insist on a local measurement that, uh, that should be defined by whatever information is carried by the particle to the detector, uh, there's no possible way to get the same statistics as the quantum statistics. So this is disturbing because what it implies is that the measurement on the left instantaneously affects the measurement on the right detector, no matter how far away they are. And, uh, and of course, it, this has been shown experimentally to be true, but uh, this is an ex exercise in you using the EPR SIM, and you can test your understanding of this uh, program by finding those probabilities and the correlations for these particular settings for this particular quantum state, and try to figure out whether it's entangled or factorable. Okay, the fourth libraries are Mini OOF, Barron's library from a long time ago. And uh, I have a ANSI terminal control library and the simple strings library that are part of K4th, which may be easily, uh, uh, the relevant parts may be easily used in other fourth systems. And we use the fourth scientific libraries, these particular files from it. Algorithm number 60, which is a complex library word set that's developed by Dr. Noble and uh, Dr. Williams, David Williams, and uh, then a random number generator for doing these Monte Carlo trials. Um, and I give links here for all of the relevant code. So the EPR SIM code, I think I linked on an earlier slide. And it uses the uh, object-oriented facilities provided by Mini OOF. And this is an example of the quantum state class with uh, the different, different uh, probability amplitudes and then some various associated functions. Um, and then a text graphic class for the different visual elements of the user interface. The ones in orange still need to be converted to uh, the classes, class objects, but uh, I just haven't had a chance to do that yet. And I was inspired to do this program by uh, an article, which I read back in 87 or so, but uh, went back to uh, for the for this program. 
And I'd like to dedicate this presentation to the, to the people who taught me quantum theory. You know, these, these two professors, Shi Yu Wu and Wagen Mersbacher, they've passed away, but uh, you know, they, have a, they, they live on with me. And, uh, and that's, that's the end of my talk. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you very much for your talk, Krishna. If there's any questions on Twitch, please go ahead and ask them now. Otherwise, in big blue button, please uh, raise your hand if you have a question. So uh, maybe I'll just start with the first question. Uh, you pointed out several times that this can be tried by ourselves. What kind of system do we need to run your code? Is it... Uh, Okay, I, I wrote it for, uh, it's pretty much standard for it. There's a few little extensions, but on one of the slides, there is a, uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. Sorry. There's some compatibility definitions that are linked here. It's a message I posted on complying forth that includes the compatibility definitions that you will need. And, and then, um, uh, there are only really a few words from the strings library that, uh, that you would need, but you can substitute your own for string concatenation uh, and number string conversion. Uh, so it's it's really, I think it's fairly easy to put in any words that uh, from either of these libraries from one well, specific I, I... libraries that you may use. I think it's great that you that you made it a uh, terminal program. That way, it's very good and easy to port, I guess, to other platforms as well. I will yeah, get, definitely I mean, it give would it be a nice try. As a, a graphics program, but yeah, please do. And uh, I'm always looking for feedback. Yeah, we already it, got uh, two questions for you, Anton. Would you please go first? Okay. Yes, it's not a question, but there was um, um, yeah. about the link. I posted the link to the to the slides on both. Uh, a big blue button chat and on the metamos chat in, in uh, town okay. square okay thank Great. you very thank much you. and bernd the interesting thing here is that a lot of people made experiments with this uh epr experiment mm -hmm. and uh the static all succeeded but uh, there are only two dynamic experiments and they failed for different reasons to be conclusive. They actually succeeded showing this property, but they failed to show that there's no alternative theory providing this property. Oh, oh there, there is an alternative, alternative theory, in fact. Uh, and it, it not, is with these... No, 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 not this hidden explorer variable. No alternative theory. Hidden variables is one precise alternative. The other alternative is information traveling from the measurement equipment back to the source of the particle. And that is mm -hmm. okay. If you have a static experiment, you can assume that this is in theory possible. That your measurement equipment, your magnet, influences the creation of these entangled particles. And even if they are far apart. And when you have a static experiment, the, the information flow allows to be compatible with the special relativity because you have ample of time. When you have a dynamic experiment and you change these magnets and you can change them quite yeah. fast yeah. today. And that, then that's you, how some of the measurements were done when the it, particles were in flight. They changed the angles randomly. So. The magnets need to change their measurement angles to have a dynamic setup of this experiment. Well, it, this was done, done with photons, uh, which don't have magnetic moments, but you, you can use polarizers and photons. And yeah, or polarizers. You, you can use polarizers and you change the polarizers. Polarizers, you can switch very fast. Magnets is not so easy, but yeah, polarizers, yeah, yeah. You, you can really be really fast. You can switch them in a microsecond or so. And people did that and they did not come to a conclusive result. That is the interesting mm. thing. Well, I'm, okay, I have to go back and look at the 1987 or eight, well, the one, 
experiments done in the nineteen eighties in France. That, in order to say I thought experiment was very easy to figure out the bug. Uh, that was the Fran French experiment. Yeah. He had a distance of six meters between source and measurement, and it was operating at fifty megahertz. Mm -hmm. And if you multiply the two, you get 300,000 meters per second, which is a very nice constant of <laughs> exactly the speed of this particles he was measuring. Okay. So With photons, this has been done at, at kilometers and tens of kilometers. Yeah, but static, you know, static, that static. And the dynamic experiments show up to be extremely difficult. There was only one dynamic experiment done after this aspect experiment and mm -hmm. it failed for visibility well i would we like to show... i would like to suggest uh, now that krishna has made everything available bernd maybe you can build a pawn of this and make it a dynamic simulator as well and we <laughs> yeah, shall yeah, have yeah. the greatest uh, <laughs> the greatest quantum simulator there is uh, bob armstrong had a question as well yeah, um, i i uh, want to point out any any scalar if you will function that you may have in fourth um, it really is just one line to, if you will, make it a, a cozy list function, inheriting all the vocabulary to, which is really designed to deal with the, with the uh, combinatoric application of functions to combinatoric sets of data. So you can go and, yeah, you know, immediately, yeah. Okay. Make it all apply to plurals. I'll put it that way. Yeah, some whole... people have also done uh, some list packages in uh, in fourth, and and you know that's one of the problems I, I've had I, with is, uh, again. I, I really you know, cozy is is evolving very directly from from um, um, K. And, and so if you want to be, I, I'd put it this way, if you want to be competitive with a language like K or APL in terms of the expression of, of this physics or, or whatever complex, it's why K and, in, in, and, and APLs, like APL is used to put together the, the um, annual report of BIS, of, of Bank of International Settlements. And, and I was quite interested last night in how much finance and so forth, those, those are the complex problems that have to be answered real time or, or on a on, on microsecond basis, because that's, that's one of the things that, that K, I, I used to get to this this uh, seminar at, at um, NYU Courant on, on on financial applications, and all of it was about big, large tails, fat tails on on the on, on the the ongoing trades with responses with with actually high speed lines to the exchanges. So you could beat the other guy by milliseconds. I mean, that was one of those topics last night that was just interesting, the time scale of these things. But but that's that's the competition, okay? All Thank right. You. Thank you, Bob. Uh, is there any final question or final remark? We would have time for one more question. Okay, well, in that case, Krishna, thank you very much for this talk. We will definitely give it a try. Thank you.